for being with us today. Uh, we're so excited. We had such a great turnout uh, for registrants. And I'm going to introduce Roy Thilly, uh, the Climate Change Coalition's Steering Committee co-chair. Um, and he will give a little brief intro for Tia. Thanks very much, Nicole. Nicole is the uh, coordinator for the coalition and really does a fabulous job for us, which we really appreciate. Uh, and I'd like to thank everybody who is here tonight. I see a lot of familiar names on the attendee list and welcome and thank you for the, your support and interest in this issue. Uh, we're really pleased to have Tia uh, join us tonight. We were planning on uh, Tia coming up this summer and doing a program. She often visits Door County and unfortunately um, that suffered the fate of many things this summer. Uh, and this fall. Uh, but we are really glad to have her uh, virtually present with us. And I'm really pleased to introduce her. Tia's a good friend, uh, really. Um, she's going to talk about the video a little bit, and then we'll show it and uh, reflect on her father's legacy as a hero of the environmental movement in the US. But what I want to say now is I think it's really important for us all to recognize that in addition to safeguarding her dad's legacy, Tia is a very strong, uh, very dedicated, tireless, inter internationally known and effective environmentalist and environmental advocate in her own right. And someone who has been on the front lines of the climate change crisis way ahead of most of us that are on this video tonight. She spent 17 years at the Nature Conservancy in DC before coming back to Wisconsin in 2004. Uh, and at the Nature Conservancy, she was the director of global climate change, uh, their global climate change initiative. And she was in Rio back in 1992 when George H.W. Bush signed the United Nations uh, framework on climate change, which was a really important step forward. Um, and interestingly received the EPA's Climate Protection Award in the year 2000, an award I suspect has, that has been in the deep freeze for the last four years. Um, and then in 2004, uh, she came back and she was executive secretary of the um, uh, Wisconsin Board of Commissioners of Public Lands uh, and co-chaired Governor Doyle's Global Warming Task Force. Um, she's well known in the, uh, at the Board of uh, Commissioners for having been ordered not to discuss or mention the words climate change and uh, for uh, where the uh, then Secretary of the, the Secretary of the Treasurer of Wisconsin um, sought to discipline her for reading the New York Times, um, a precursor of the current fake news controversy. In 2015, she joined Outrider Foundation in Madison and has been their managing director of climate change for the last five years, really focusing on educating people about the science of climate change and inspiring action. Um, the other thing I want to want to mention, I think it's really important to realize and to uh, applaud is Tia has her father's good humor and ability to listen and talk with people who are across the aisle, who don't necessarily agree on many issues, uh, make friends and still remain true to her principles, which is extremely important. So Tia, I'm gonna turn it over to you uh, to introduce the video, thanks. Yeah. Well, th thanks, Roy. That was a uh, impressive in, uh, introduction. I wish I believed it all. Um, uh, I'm really grateful for this opportunity to sh uh, show the film uh, that I made um, uh, in honor of the past, the present, and the future of the environmental movement as uh, I reflect on my father's legacy, which is obviously quite you know, personally important to me to uh, honor and recognize, but I didn't want this film to be uh, some sentimental look back uh, as important and valuable as, as our history might be. 
but I wanted to contextualize my father's message uh, so that it uh, uh, showed its relevance to the environmental movement today, um, the present, and and what it might look like uh, in the future. And uh, uh, if, uh, for me, the um, journey of making this film, which was really a challenge, Roy, you you at, at the top of your introduction of me mentioned that I was in Rio de Janeiro when Republican President Her George Herbert Walker Bush signed the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and said, I paraphrase, um, the United States shall lead the world. The United States shall lead the world in addressing the existential crisis of climate change. Well, that was a long time ago and there are many, um, um, paths that, that were not taken, that we could have taken, that, that would have us in, in a more positive place in terms of addressing climate change. But I, when I reflect on my father's legacy and reflect on how long it took him to come up with this resonant idea that ended up being successful beyond his wildest dreams, the first Earth Day, April 22nd, 1970, 20 million people from around the world, uh, from around the uh, United States gathered the largest secular event in American history. Um, that was successful beyond my father's wildest dreams because of individual action, because of people just like those who are on the call tonight, um, uh, wondering what they can do, how they can become involved, um, and how they can make an impact. And um, that power of individual action is, is something that to me um, uh, sustains me in, in this long, difficult journey to address the biggest environmental challenge of our time. So I, I, I'm grateful to Outrider Foundation for uh, funding the film. I'm grateful to Varshini Prakash. She, um, as you'll hear her story, uh, will play the film momentarily. Varshini Prakash uh, is the co-founder of the Sunrise Movement, um, one of the leading youth activists in the world. Um, uh, Joe Biden was smart enough to put her on the climate um, drafting uh, platform committee. Um, her, her organization was um, played a critical role in conceptualizing the Green New Deal. And Varshini appears as the bookend with Bob Inglis, uh, a conservative former uh, Republican congressman, uh, former climate change skeptic, um, devout evangelical Christian. Um, the two of them come at the issue of climate change from very, very different perspectives in terms of the solutions from a public policy standpoint, but both of them have in this deep and honorable way dedicated their lives to um, addressing this challenge. And to me, having Bob and Varshini agree to work with me and amplify my father's voice and contextualize that for this particular moment in time, I felt like, you know, the luckiest gal in the world. And so um, uh, I look forward to talking a little more about um, um, the message of the film, but let's, let's take a look. Andy, can you uh, give it a play for us? Our goal is not just an environment of clean air and water and scenic beauty while forgetting about the worst environments in America. Our goal is an environment of decency, quality, and mutual respect for all human beings and all other living creatures. Our goal is a decent environment in its broadest and deepest sense. And it will require a long, sustained political, moral, ethical, and financial commitment far beyond any commitment ever made by any society in the history of man.
My name is Tia Nelson. I am the daughter of Gaylord Nelson, the founder of Verse. My father was an extraordinary dad. He was an extraordinary leader. Growing up as his daughter, it was mostly a great privilege, but also I felt a heavy sense of duty to public service uh, and to making a difference with my life. I work for the Outrider Foundation. Our goal is to educate people about big global challenges like climate change. One of my favorite quotes from my father was delivered on the eve of the first Earth Day in 1970. He said, ecology is a big, a big science, science not, not a narrow one. one. It's a big concept. And it is concerned with all the ramifications of all the relationships of all living creatures to each other and their environment. So when he talked about the environment, he talked about ecology and environment in the broadest sense, in the most inclusive sense. That idea resonated with students across the country. Collectively, they made a difference that was unforeseeable. This movement and this fight is about all of us because what is more fundamental than the air that we breathe, than water? than the soil that we stand on, than the land that we love. Like, what is more fundamental to every single one of us than that? My name is Varshini Prakash. I am from Boston, Massachusetts, and I am one of the co-founders of Sunrise Movement. We are building a movement of young people all across this nation to stop the climate crisis and create millions of good jobs for our generation in the process. And when I began looking back into what the first Earth Day was like, what it meant, the level of people who got involved, the kind of political action, I think for me, Earth Day now is about getting back to our roots. My father was brilliant at working across the aisle to build a consensus. Um, he knew when to compromise. He knew when to stick to his principles. Think of all of the important environmental laws that were passed after that first Earth Day, and they were passed um, uh, with significant support from both parties. For six years, um, I said that climate change was nonsense in as much as I represented Greenville, Spartanburg, South Carolina, probably one of the reddest districts, in the reddest state of the nation. Um, that was the end of the inquiry for me. So I, I admit that's fairly ignorant, but that's the way it was for six years. So I'm uh, Bob Inglis, and I run an outfit called RepublicEN.org, where conservatives, convincing conservatives that they're really good on climate and that they've got the answer. It's free enterprise innovation. My son, the eldest of our five kids, came to me. He uh, was voting for the first time because he just turned 18. And he said to me, Dad, I'll vote for you, but you're going to clean up your act on the environment. It's the first of a three-step metamorphosis for me. And step two was going to Antarctica with the science committee, seeing the evidence in the ice core drillings. Uh, step three was another science committee trip. It's there that uh, at a stopover at the Great Barrier Reef, great uh, blessing there was meeting an Australian climate scientist named Scott Heron and just being inspired by his faith to act on climate change. When Bob spoke about climate change while serving in the United States Congress, he was primaried and he lost his election. He was attacked for speaking the words climate change. This was a transformative moment in his life and led to him dedicating his whole career today to addressing the climate change challenge. For young people growing up in this country, we have been defined by the climate crisis. People who have been born after the year 2000 have never lived a year on this planet that wasn't one of the hottest years on record. We are the climate generation. And so now, at a young age, we have realized that if our politicians aren't going to do something about this problem, then we have to take matters into our own hands. Through leadership of people like Varshini, the youth movement has been energized in the last year in ways that uh, resemble what was happening almost 50 years ago when the first Earth Day occurred. There comes a place where activism drives even the crustiest old timer to decide to get involved. I don't think there's any other issue viewed in its broadest sense, which is as critical to mankind as the issue of the quality of the environment in which we live. Environmentalism is not a partisan issue. Environmentalism is a quality of life issue for all of us. You know, I'm very optimistic about the future. I think we're going to solve climate change. It's going to be that conservatives come together with progressives to 
figure out we're literally in this together. This is about not just changing light bulbs, this is about changing our politics. And if anything, we will be successful because we do it together. I want the youth of today to know that I have done everything that I can to ensure on the 100th anniversary of Earth Day, we are celebrating a brighter future. We're at a critical moment in history. We have an opportunity to address the greatest environmental challenge of our time. Are we able? Yes. Are we willing? That's the unanswered question. Thanks, Tia. Um, can you hear me? I've got to keep I, checking. I can, yeah. Okay. Uh, great movie. And I'm, uh, we'll have a little conversation and then open it up for other questions. Um, I think this movie was going to premiere, was it, for the 50th anniversary of, of Earth Day, which yeah. got. Well, it, you know, it, um, I feel um, uh, terrible for all the folks who had organized in-person events. That was, you know, um, such a critical element of what, what made the first Earth Day successful was that people gathered wherever they were in whatever manner was relevant to them and their communities uh, to take action. That couldn't happen this last um, Earth Day because of COVID. Um, our film did um, still, uh, it, op it uh, opened the EarthX event in Dallas, a virtual event um, uh, uh, of national um, stature. And then, but uh, maybe perhaps most um, exciting for me and Bob and Varshini is we closed out the Smithsonian Institute's Earth Optimism event with the film and a short panel discussion with uh, Varshini, Bob and I about, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, odd bedfellows of the three musketeers as it were. Um, so we, we did, we got, we got some good coverage because we had this, you know, quality digital content to, to provide to people to tell the story. And uh, we got some, some great play in it. I, I was really grateful for that. Thanks. So, and on the optimism side, we've had a, a change in administration that is occurring um, and a Congress that may be split. What do you see on the horizon in terms of addressing climate change at the federal level while the clock is ticking? Yeah, well, that's a great question. And uh, I would, it, one part of my answer is uh, anybody who, uh, any prognosticator who tells you they can predict the future um, uh, should not be trusted. Um, and, but I, I will tell you, based on my talking to um, uh, NGO leaders, thought leaders, scientists, policymakers, inside and outside the administration, there's, there are really, really mighty um, challenges in front of us, but also mighty opportunities. Uh, I, one can expect um, uh, President Biden in 2021 uh, to do everything he can to reverse uh, a number of the environmental rollbacks that were um, uh, implemented by uh, the current administration. Uh, through executive order, um, my under you know I think there's enormous potential in transportation, in public infrastructure, in um, in in the Midwest particularly relevant is um, nature-based solutions. How we can uh, improve uh, timber and uh, ag management to sequester carbon out of the atmosphere and and achieve other environmental uh, benefits uh, for habitat, wetlands, um, flood mitigation, um, and so many other things. 
Um, I think that uh, the biggest challenge will be that our expectations for change are high. Um, our hunger for that is significant. Um, and But the current politics means that we're going to look at incremental wins. Um, and, um, you know, for th that, that's going to be the challenge, to find those places where you can build the bridges to create the political will for action. And if, if you look at, and Roy, you know this part much better than I, the cost of renewables, you know, has dropped so significantly between when we, uh, you and I co-chaired the Governor Doyle's Global Warming Task Force and today, such that uh, renewables are more than cost competitive with uh, fossil fuels. Um, uh, this is changing um, how we think about what a um, um, future in which we've addressed climate change looks like. And the Midwest has, has uh, so much opportunity to contribute to that both in manufacturing and renewable energy, which you know better than I, but also in um, changes in land use practices. And um, so I'm excited, but I'm also, um, you know, I'm not Pollyannish. Uh, the, the politics of divisiveness and with which, uh, within which we live um, will remain a challenge for some time to come. But hey, I, what do I celebrate? I celebrate the fact I got Varshini Bakash and Bob English to join me in the same film, you know? So, uh, or I celebrate the fact that my father and, and, and Melvin Layard, Secretary of Defense during the Vietnam War, which my father opposed uh, vociferously, uh, somehow managed to fight all day and, and uh, remain friends um, at the end of the day. Um, uh, I think we, we, we have to recommit ourselves to that notion of building bridges. And if we do that, I think we can accomplish a lot. Um, uh, uh, President-elect Biden, Joe Biden has been around for a long time. I, I think he was in the Senate or maybe in the House when your father was still in the, he was probably in the Senate when your father was still in the Senate. Is that correct? He was, you know, actually, it's a really cool story, and it's been circulating since Biden was in Wisconsin, since Biden was elected. My father was elected to the Senate in 62, uh, so he entered this, he was sworn in in 63. I can't remember what year Biden joined, but um, the um, Joe is, did a radio interview after my father's memorial service in which he said my parents changed his life that that were it not for my father he never would have taken his senate seat he lost his wife and daughter in that tragic accident um, both of his other two children his sons um, one of whom is living uh, the other Bo, of, of who, who passed a brain cancer both his sons were hospitalized his wife and daughter had passed and he had just been elected senator and he was about to turn to the governor um, uh, of Delaware and um, have him appoint a replacement because he because he didn't think he could um, assume his seat and my father uh, by Joe's telling persuaded him to do so and my mother who he gives an enormous amount of credit to as well. I'm, I'm at mom's house in DC d helping care for her now. Um, d you know, my mom took him under wing and d made some meals and provided some comfort. And my father told him, I need you in the Senate to fight for um, the things we care about. And um, so, uh, in in Biden's words, my, my parents, and I love the fact that he speaks of both of them, not just my father, but also my mother, um, um, shape, you know, shape, shaped his life at a core and in critical time. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah, I, I know when most of our audience is in Door County tonight, and I'm sure they're interested in Wisconsin and um, do you have any insight on what's happening in terms of 
development of a climate action plan. I, we, you and I have talked about that. I think we wrote an op-ed a couple of years about it, years ago about it in the Milwaukee Journal, uh, but we're still waiting. Um, yeah, so I, my, here's my understanding. The um, task force um, uh, pre-COVID was gonna do a bunch of in-person listening sessions. I think a few of those occurred before COVID shut it down. Um, they had three working groups, have three working groups, um, uh, a land use, uh, resiliency and infrastructure and um, renewables and jobs. And those three groups uh, ended up meeting virtually. There were some in-person meetings, but they ended up finalizing a set of recommendations for each of those three silos, three of those those three issue areas. Um, and a set of recommendations have been uh, drafted and submitted uh, and are residing in the governor's office and should be released by the governor in the relatively new, near future as a set of recommendations around um, those three uh, uh, issue areas. So we can expect to see something um, soon and um, uh, of course, the challenge will be uh, figuring out what's actionable and how to create the, the political and social will to, to take action, really. That's what, that's what it's all about, you know. We know what we need to do. We just need to do it. <laughs> so if they call you and ask, what are the top things that we do need to do in Wisconsin, what would you tell them? Um, I tell them to call Roy Silly for uh, all recommendations on uh, uh, renewable energy and transmission. Um, and I would say that there's uh, enormous opportunity in America's heartland in Wisconsin and elsewhere to um, improve how we manage our, our, our farm and forest uh, and conservation lands. Um, to enhance their conservation values and sequester carbon out of the atmosphere. It's a part of the problem, important part of the solution. Um, and um, yeah, those, those would be my two, my two big recommendations. That's great. I think it's interesting that um, transportation has actually overtaken uh, emissions from electric utilities uh, for contributing to climate change today because so many coal plants have been shut down across the country and including some in Wisconsin. So the, if we can move transportation to uh, electrification as opposed to burning gas uh, and have the electric system uh, uh, be primarily renewable, non-carbon decarbonized sources, uh, there's real potential to go forward. Yeah, it, it, um, it's interesting that you say that. A, a, a couple of the big Washington NGOs have identified just what you said as a, as a big opportunity because there's a real incentive for utilities who see the market in electrification of vehicles as potentially quite favorable to them. I think that's really important. Oh, absolutely. And they're not going to make money by building new coal plants. No one is going to do that given the risk and the long lead times and cost overruns, but increasing demand through transportation is the key to growth in that industry. And so the economic drivers are important. You know, I mean, uh, the uh, doing the right thing is always important, but the economic drivers help a lot. Um, so uh, one of the things that, um, that I mentioned at the introduction is the ability to talk to people about climate change who, um, who you don't necessarily agree with. Do you have um, any advice to people listening on how to do that? Because if we talk only to the choir, we sort of go in circles and get nowhere. Yeah, that's a great question, Roy. I spent a lot of time thinking about it. Um, you know, I'd summarize it by saying that, you know, if it, speaking to the choir, if, you know, environmentalists could get us across the finish line, we'd be here by, we'd be there by now, right? Um, I spend um, most of my time these days thinking about how to reach beyond the choir and how to 
um, tell compelling stories um, that uh, meet people where they are, whatever that value proposition might be. Um, Outrider is, I mean, it's one of the reasons I thought loaning Bob Inglis's voice to our Earth Day film was so important. Um, another example would be a, uh, Brent Suter, the pitcher for the Milwaukee Brewers is um, a big environmental advocate and um, um, really cool guy uh, who's dedicated his off the field life and actually is on the field life. He's done, he's promoted a, um, a bunch of uh, environmentally sustainable practices that the Brewers um, um, Corporation has uh, adopted. Uh, Brent can reach people I can't reach, you know. Uh, if you talk, one, one of the best climate change, th there are two climate change communicators that I follow um, and who I think are noteworthy. One is Catherine Hayhoe, Hayhoe who has a YouTube series um, called Global Weirding, Global Weirding. Um, and it answers pretty much every question you might ever ask about climate change, um, uh, and including, you know, what's the most important thing I can do? And Catherine's riff there is the most important thing you can do is talk about it. Um, talk to your neighbors, your family, your friends, your municipal representatives, your elected officials. Um, um, and so, uh, the, the other uh, spokesperson, the, the other person who communicates really well on climate change um, uh, is Jonathan Foley from Project Drawdown, which ranks the 100 top climate solutions. I know you guys had uh, Jonathan, if I recall correctly, speak at a previous um, in, uh, uh, coalition gathering. Um, and so uh, both of them are very effective in my view for a couple of reasons. One is they, they sit down and listen and meet people where they are, hear what their value propositions are, speak to them for, you know, from that place of value. Um, number two, and just as importantly, they talk about solutions, really. Well, you know, and I, I've had so many you know, debates with uh, friends. Um, do I really need a mother who's rushing to, serve breakfast to their child and get them off to um, school. Uh, do I need her to understand climate science 101? To understand that I, I don't. What I want her to understand is her child who might not go to school today because of an asthma attack because of the coal plant down the street or because of the emissions coming out of the um, tailpipe of an automobile. Um, that, that there are uh, cost competitive alternatives to that. And so, you know, I, listening is a really important part of the question. Uh, do, Catherine makes this funny joke about, um, uh, you know, how she doesn't hunt or fish, but so it wouldn't be a good strategy for her to go, you know, uh, talk about climate change and its impact on on trout reproduction in Wisconsin. But if you're a fisherman, that, that would be, um, you know, that would be a, a point of entry into the conversation. So uh, really listening and um, meeting people where they are, understanding their values and their concerns um, and understanding that stories are more important than science, really uh, as important as science is, um, listening to one's personal story and finding some shared value is is critical, and um, I think if you do that, you you'll find you know you can move mountains really. Great, I you know I'm going to stop hogging the uh, questions now, um, and uh, I see we have some in the question and answer uh, session. So I will mute myself and turn it over to Nicole, who will field the questions to you. Thanks very much. Thanks, Roy. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much, Tia. That was great. Um, I, I'm going to just say my own little bit here that I can attest to there being a crisis like a pandemic and having young children 
affected going to school and the sacrifices you make or just the you know the craziness at home of trying to keep your kids safe and trying to actually you know have a job and do it well so I can attest to say that doing this for our kids is probably one of the most important things because a crisis like the climate crisis with any other crisis on top of that like a pandemic would just be unimaginable and um, very disrupting to all of our lives. So thank you for mentioning that. Um, so we're gonna start with the first one here uh, from Steve H. And he said he would be interested to know your thoughts as to the biggest or three to five biggest reasons for climate change denial. And how do we have a conversation with those who are staunch deniers? Oh, I'll take uh, the second half uh, first. Um, I wouldn't spend much time uh, at all with climate deniers and, and uh, for two reasons. One is um, it's in a tiny group. I mean, it's just a tiny fraction. Um, uh, yeah, uh, Yale it has a, uh, this ongoing polling and research project. Um, the Climate Communications Project, and they've categorized Americans um, through the quote unquote six Americas. Uh, and, and those who are staunch deniers are really a tiny fraction. And so um, they're not worth uh, the time because they're a small uh, portion of the populace and because they're not persuadable. So I, I wouldn't even, my, my honest advice is don't bother. Um, what, what's most interesting to me about this Yale research, the Six Americas project, it, it, uh, uh, the Six Americas, um, is that there are people who are alarmed. I suspect that most of the people on this call tonight would fall into that category. And then there are people who are concerned and cautious. And these are degrees of worry um, and they each need different messages right the, the the alarmed already completely understands uh, the existential threat um, and is fearful um, the cautious it has some comprehension of it but is really needs to know what what is it that we what do we want them to do right um, so there's a variety of perspectives. Um, I think each perspective um, would benefit from a, uh, uh, an approach recognizing where that person is in terms of how they're thinking about the issue. But in terms of climate deniers, um, forget them. There's not that many. Um, they're noisy. Uh, they, they, they seem proportionally larger than they actually are. But there's not that many and they're not persuadable. So I wouldn't waste my time. Good answer. Okay, uh, we're gonna go to David and Rennie Lee. Um, they're asking, how can we find out the big hidden climate deniers that are acting behind the politicians? There's lots of money involved in this. Oh, well, that's, a, you know, that's a, a different version of the first question. Uh, the, 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 the dark money, you know, fueling some of the political opposition, they're not deniers, for God's sake, uh, some of them were involved in the early science. Uh, think ExxonMobil. Um, I mean, the disinformation campaign run by the fossil fuel industry around this issue uh, rivals in its uh, hubris the, that of the tobacco industry. Um, and that's a big issue. It's a big issue in any, it, any element in which one cares about democracy, dark money and, and uh, the, I, you know, it's funny, I think a lot of a Republican friend of mine now passed who I, wanted to recruit into the environmental cause. And he said, no, no, I only have, I only have one cause in life before, um, before I you know, am not on this earth. And it is to um, overturn Citizens United, the Supreme Court decision that says you know, money's free speech. And 
get dark money out of politics and, and, and eliminate gerrymandering. I laughed. I said, oh, I guess your job's a little easier than mine. Um, uh, I was, we were talk, joking about climate change. But uh, my, my point is that the dark money that's finding, funding the disinformation campaign, they're, they're not deniers. They, they, they fuel a message of denial, but they themselves are not deniers. It's, it's, um, it's a bit, um, it's, it's the other side of the coin to the first question, I guess. So this next one is from Terry and what aspects, what, I'm sorry, what specific actions can Biden take with respect to increasing renewables and reducing fossil fuel use if Mitch fights them all the way as he did with Obama? Well, there's, there's a few and Roy understands a couple of these plays better than I, but you can reduce a lot of greenhouse gas emissions by tightening mercury rules, uh, for example, or uh, methane rules, for example, all of which can be done under the existing legal construct of the Clean Air Act. Um, and um, yeah, you know, it'll be really consequential. What happens in Georgia will be really consequential, but let's not fool ourselves. Even if the uh, Democrats win both of those seats, it's then a 50-50 Senate. Um, and there are uh, Democrats who um, have a um, uh, political, uh, you know, um, the inclination to continue to support for now anyway the uh, the fossil fuel industries that with which their constituents have developed such a strong identity you know however you know even though there's not a lot of jobs there so my point is the job's going to be tough whether M Mitch McConnell's majority leader or not um, there's a lot that can be done by executive order. There's also a d d d Roy touched in at, at this at, at the top the call, uh, there are opportunities um, in um, transportation and electrification. Um, uh, there's also opportunities in other areas because customers are demanding clean energy. And there, there are um, things that can be done, but it, it's going to be challenging. It'll be more incremental than some of us would like to see. Um, but uh, Heck, it beats the alternative um, in really significant ways. And there is a lot that can be done by executive order and a lot that can be done under the Clean Air Act. And a couple of places where I think there'll be bipartisan cooperation, surprisingly enough. You know, on, on that, if I could jump in, the um, Obama administration couldn't get anything through Congress, but they did adopt the Clean Power Plan through the EPA and the air pollution regulation. Um, that has, there's been a, a move to undo that, and I don't know the intricacies of re-upping re it, but I think that's a definite possibility. And the interesting thing is almost every major utility in the country has now, electric utility, has announced a plan to get to zero carbon by 2050. Now we may feel that's a little too late and it should be 2040 or 2035, but you know, those numbers change over time as R and D changes. But um, there's a deal to be made between the utilities that want electrification of transportation and decarbonizing the supply simultaneously. The other thing is that the federal government is a huge consumer of electricity and a huge uh, transportation uh, entity. And they can lead uh, by example and by their uh, purchasing power significantly. Yeah. So there, there's some opportunities there. Thanks, Roy, for that little side bit. Um, maybe it's just a pipe dream, but maybe Biden can unite everybody in working together. <laughs> Um, next question from Chad. Is there something unique that you do to reduce your personal carbon footprint? What is it? Oh, yeah, it's a um, great question. I do a number of things. Um, uh, I uh, compost food waste. Um, 
Which is really interesting one, you know, we talk about sacrifice in, in the climate space a lot. Think about this, uh, if food waste for a country would be the third largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the world after the United States and China. And in the United States of America, we throw away 40% of the food we produce. Think of all the energy that went into producing it, transporting it, and we bring it home and shove it in the back of our large refrigerators, forget about it, and think nothing of tossing it away because it doesn't cost very much. Uh, so I figure the least I can do if I'm a part of the food waste food chain, so to speak, uh, is, you know, uh, from the ground it came back to the ground it shall go. So I compost and uh, I love and I love just sort of observing the process. Um, I've become rather, you know, uh, crazy about trying not to use single use plastic, uh, because the truth is um, a lot of the plastic um, single use plastic we put in the recycling bin doesn't actually get recycled. And it kind of makes me crazy that we use fossil fuels to create this product um, that emits fossil fuels when it decays, that we use only once and it's going to be around, you know, um, for a couple of hundred years. Um, so um, composting food waste and single use plastic are biggies for me. Um, and I make more than a few people crazy with my recycling routine. Um, it, you know, I've been known to pull stuff out of the trash. It's just, you know, and, and it's worth thinking about for one really important reason. In the, in the 1950s, nobody recycled. People threw trash out of their car. It was a cultural, as they drove down the highway. Um, Individual action is not going to solve the climate crisis, but modeling the behavior um, that represents our values, that matters. And so it's important to me that I, that I do what I can in my, you know, day-to-day -day choices and living. Um, it is not going to solve the crisis, but it does reflect my values. And in doing so, we create um, new social norms, you know. Um, and recycling would be a good, good example of that. So for me, it's plastics and food waste, mostly. Paul here would like you just to mention the issue of um, the damage to Northern Door caused by riding, uh, rising waters and storms. I guess your take on that. Well, um, I think for me, Emotionally, one of the hardest things for me emotionally approaching the 50th anniversary of Earth Day was realizing that, you know, that that political trajectory from watching a Republican president in 1992, you know, is this young, um, it's probably one of my first international trips, certainly my first UN meeting. Um, it was heady times um, and it was a long time ago. Um, if someone talked about adaptation strategies, climate change adaptation strategies 20 years ago, most of the environmental community would look at you aghast and say, you know, don't say that, we're, we're still, we're, we're working on preventing it from happening. Well, the crisis is such now that it's every tool in the toolbox. We're not just trying to reduce, avoid, and mitigate the emissions that have gone into the atmosphere and we'll continue to live in the atmosphere for a long time. We now have to accept that we have inextricably um, uh, impacted um, the uh, climate and long-term weather patterns. And that means um, lake level um, rises, that means um, more favorable conditions to invasive species. It means a whole lot of things and all coastal areas will be impacted by that. Um, and now that's a part of the package of things we have to think about. How do we build um, and invest in a more resilient future? It's not just reducing emissions now, it's also building more resilient communities that can thrive and prosper in a changing climate. Uh, we can do it, we know what we need to do. 
it's going to mar require marshalling a lot of resources and and social and political will. But um, there's no getting around the there's no getting around the fact that um, we have baked change into the system that we are going to have to adapt to. That's just the reality. All right, next question from Charlotte. Uh, what is your opinion on the Paris Agreement? Do you believe that it, it is actually effective or do you think that much more needs to be done with the Paris Agreement? Well, the Paris Agreement is a really interesting instrument. Um, I was in Kyoto, Japan, which had binding targets and timetables for countries assigned by this UN body. It was a monumental failure um, a well-intended effort, but a monumental fa failure. Um, Paris Accord was completely different. And Christiana Figueres, who, who was the secretary um, of the process uh, with whom I uh, know from many years ago, a really extraordinary person, um, working with others, had this brilliant idea of having each country enter the Paris Agreement with, um, oh, there's a, you know, a silly UN expression for it that I'm not going to remember now, nationally determined um, emissions reductions. I'm, I'm screwing up the name, but you get my drift. Um, so what was unique and important about the Paris Agreement was each country came to the table saying, we, we, we shall commit to these goals and um, we'll figure out how to achieve those goals in a way that's appropriate within our own national construct. Um, and that was a brilliant move. And I think it's really important because international cooperation is really important. Um, um, at the end of the day, it is a non-enforceable um, non-treaty. Um, that doesn't mean it's irrelevant because global cooperation is critical to addressing this crisis. Um, and I, um, uh, I'm thrilled that uh, Biden will re-enter the Paris Agreement. The United States was poised to be the only country in the world to withdraw from it. Um, and certainly it's valuable that, that all the 197 or whatever the number is today, countries uh, gather together and talk about how to, see it's a global challenge. So we have to meet uh, as, um, as global citizens and talk about how to collaborate, cooperate to address uh, the challenge. So um, I guess I'll go with the glass, the glass is half full. The US will not, you know, will we'll be party to the agreement under Biden and, and it's better that we're at the table than not. Um, I'm just going to do one last question, I think, here. We're at 7.59. Um, it's, I guess, more of a comment. And then maybe if Roy has anything to say after you're done, um, and then we can probably finish up soon. So this is from Joel Blonick. Um, and he asks, are you aware of the composition Earth Day Portrait, which was a premiered on the first Earth Day? Actually, you know, just, Nicole, it's a good example. Um, just to close, there's an example of of music as a form of communication around the issue of the environment. And Roy and you or someone from the audience was asking, you know, how to reach people who aren't um, uh, in the choir, so to, so to speak. Um, art and storytelling, whether it's uh, music, photography, film, stories, listening, um, these are all powerful ways to communicate. And uh, certainly uh, this particular political moment in time uh, begs us to, um, to listen more uh, from a uh, place of compassion and to also realize there's all kinds of ways to tell stories. And, and uh, that, that little Earth Day Symphony is, is just one example of that. The film is another example of that. Um, the work the Door County Coalition does is um, another example of that. You know, it's all of these things matter. Okay, well, um, I don't have anything to add except to say thank you.
Tia for joining us and taking the time. We just really appreciate it. And I also want to thank everybody else that joined tonight and again for their support and for their concern about this issue because that's what's going to make a difference, frankly, is that our political leaders respond to the public and uh, where the public is concerned. Um, yeah, and Roy, Roy, one optimistic note to close on. Um, the Yale Climate Communications Project, which does uh, been polling public opinion on climate change every six months for the la more than the last 10 years. So fabulous trends and uh, to tease out of the analytics there. Um, what is changing the climate change conversation is that young Republicans and young Democrats have pretty significantly equal concern about climate change. There's a big generational divide um, in the more conservative political camps um, by um, age. But if, if, if you take the younger demographic, they're not, they're not bifurcated and divided on this issue the way um, older demographics are. And that gives me a really great sense of hope. And um, that gives me a sense that we cre can create that political will. And the fact that you guys do what you do, I mean, it, it would be little groups like the Door County Climate Coalition in 1970, you know, for the 50 years ago, the first anniversary, the first Earth Day, it was it was little community groups just like this one that just showed up and did something relevant in their community and expressed their voice and concern about what they cared about in terms of clean air and clean water. Um, a Republican president. Uh, signed into law the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency and more environmental laws were passed in the decade that followed than any other time in American history. Um, and was my father's leadership critical? Yes, it was. But it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have mattered a which bit what he was saying and calling for if 20 million people didn't show up and say, this matters to me. That's our voice. That's our opportunity. Okay, well, thank you again. And for anyone interested in the, the Climate Change Coalition of Door County, we have a website. You can just Google it or you can look on Facebook and you'll see the information and how to get in touch and what we're doing. So we appreciate it very much. Thank you, Tia. I'm grateful for your work. Yeah, thank you. Good night, everyone. Thanks to everyone who showed up. Thank you.